Hello Physics 30s, it's me Mr. Jukli again. Today we're going to look at Unit 5, Lesson 5, Models of the Atom, at least some models of the atom, not all of them necessarily. Uh, so we're going to go into quite a bit more detail on the Bohr model of the atom and quite a bit more detail on the Schrodinger or quantum model of the atom. Uh, so I'll start off with this. Don't take ridiculous, 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 ridiculous bribes from Santa or Satan, depending on how you look at this. Don't take ridiculous bribes from Santa. Any ideas what I'm talking about here? If you're guessing that uh, talking about models of the atom, you are you got it, right? So don't take ridiculous bribes from Santa. Don't Dalton. Take Thompson. R. Rutherford. B. Bribes. Four, I'm losing it here, and then S. Schrodinger. So it tells us about the scientists. So we do need to know these scientists, and we need to know sort of where things all started off with and, and where we got to. Again, the main focus in the next couple days is going to be the Bohr model of the atom and the Schrodinger model of the atom, uh, but it's difficult to talk about those without knowing where things came from. So the models of the atom that we talk about today are going to correspond very, very nicely with the classical theory. So classical theory of EMR talks about Newton's laws of motion and Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism. So first off, Dalton's billiard ball. Lots of people think, oh, that's not how atoms work. And, you know, I learned in Science 10 that atoms are totally different, protons, electrons, neutrons, and stuff like that. That doesn't mean that this is a bad model. Uh, it just means that there were some issues with it and some issues that needed to be worked out. The nice things about this is this is the first recorded evidence that we have of anybody thinking about matter being quantized. So again, small individual atoms, right? You can't divide them up anymore. They're individual. Each one is unique. So atoms are the smallest particles of matter. Absolutely, we still kind of think that's the case. Uh, Dalton could explain tons of things like chemical reactions. Dalton's model did a great job explaining chemical reactions. One of the things in those chemical reactions is our law of conservation of matter. So any chemical reaction, the mass before has to equal our total mass after. That's why we balance equations in chemistry. Thank you, Dalton. Um, why? Well, it's because things come together in simple whole number ratios and matter can't be created or destroyed, just simply rearranged. So here we have water forming where I have hydrogen, I've got oxygen, and it comes together in these whole number ratios. So for every one oxygen, we have two hydrogens. Very, very nice. He also helps to explain the nature of elements. So each element has its own distinct physical properties. For example, pure gold versus pure mercury. I bet you you can pick uh, pick out a couple of distinct properties from each of these just by looking at it. Right? So elements have distinct properties. Each element has its own unique atom is the reason for this. Now this is an old school periodic table before our modern one that Mendeleev put together for us. Uh, for example, it has these symbols. Could you imagine have to, having to remember that phosphorus was a hippie or lime was Charlie Brown um, and knowing all those symbols? It also has stuff that we now know is not elements. So like soda and lime, those are not elements. They're made out of elements, they're compounds. At the time, people thought they were elements though. Cool. <clears throat> he also talked about the nature of molecules. Right? And we, we kind of already mentioned this with chemical reactions, but uh, the nature of molecules. Molecules always come together in fixed ratios. Um, cool. So, yeah, if matter is quantized, the molecules must be in those simple whole number ratios. You can't have, like, half of a carbon and 1.4 of an oxygen or anything like that. He could not explain what holds molecules together. So like, why is sodium chloride? Why does that have such a high melting point um, where the sodium is stuck to the chlorine? He could not explain many properties of the physical, of the periodic table. So why, for example, everything in group one reacts very, very vigorously with water. So lots and lots and lots of little issues there. 
to lead us out of the Dalton model of the atom uh, is actually a guy named Crookes. So in 1879, he created this apparatus called the Crookes tube. It later got renamed to a cathode ray tube. I have no idea why he still doesn't get credit for this. I mean, he does, but like his name's not on it anymore. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, this is kind of a weird thing. So we had, and you can see it here, and I wish we were in the class right now because I could actually show you the green glowing ray. Um, but essentially what we have is over here, and where is it on this one? Over here, I think, uh, we've got two different electrodes. Those electrodes uh, create a very, very, very large potential difference, and it essentially pulls something, I'm giving you a little hint right there, from one side towards the other. Turns out later on, it's kind of hard to see on those particular color scheme, at least for me. Uh, later on, we discovered that they're electrons, but pulled something across this green, weird glowing beam. So here's sort of an easier diagram for this. Again, I can't really show you the demo right now, but uh, you can check out some cathode ray tubes. I'm, I'm sure if you looked at uh, YouTube, you could find something for it. So green glowing rays called cathode rays because they came from the cathode. Uh, here's the actual picture. This is what I would show you. Uh, in the classroom, and we could actually mess around it with some ma mess around with it with some magnets. There we go. Um, so people didn't know what these cathode rays were. Were they particles? Were they some form of EMR, like light? So maybe it's just like a laser beam of EMR. Not that people had lasers back then. So they started to investigate a little bit. It could cast shadows, right? So it can absolutely cast shadows. Light does that. But particles would also do that. Like if you're blasting particles at the cross, it would create like a space behind it where no particles would go, right? Because light travels in straight lines, but hey, so does matter. It could spin a paddle wheel. Absolutely. So a paddle wheel is just exactly what you imagine. When they hit, I don't know which way it's actually going in this case, but if they're going this way, when they hit the paddle wheel, they cause it to rotate around in that direction. Cathode rays can do that which just means they have kinetic energy and momentum. Well, it's starting to look more like particle properties, but EMR can technically do that too. We'll learn about EMR and EMR momentum in our next lesson, or sorry, in the previous lesson. Um, we learned about that in the previous lesson. Here's the, uh, the big thing that we see. The cathode rays were deflected by a magnetic field. What is deflected by a magnetic field? I'll give you a big hint. Think hand rule number three. Hand rule number three. You could even check out the, uh, the bottom diagram there. So if the North Pole is coming out of the page towards you, that means that your fingers need to be coming out of the page towards you. Your palm needs to be facing downwards because it looks like those cathode rays are being pushed downwards. And that means that the electrons must have been moving, or sorry, <laughs> I keep giving it away there. The charged particles must have been moving in this direction in order for that to happen. Could that happen with, if they were positively charged particles? So magnetic field out of the page, uh, if they're positively, you're using your right hand. That means if they're positive, the force would be upwards. They have to be negatively charged particles. We know that it's not EMR because, well, magnets don't deflect EMR. So that's fairly straightforward. So here's a bit of, a little bit better of a diagram. Um, charged particles, they're negatively charged particles because you can make your right hand fit this, but you cannot make your left hand fit this. So they are indeed negatively charged particles. Cool. So, why did those lead us to a new model of the atom? Well, in Dalton's model, did they have charged particles? Not so much. Did they have little tiny particles that could leave and not really change the mass? Not so much. So there has to be charged particles, right? Has to be charged particles. And if these are all negatives that are leaving, tiny, tiny, tiny little negatives that don't really change the mass, but definitely change the charge, that means that there's got to be some sort of positive left behind, because when they're together, they're neutral. Perfect. So we're starting to get the idea of this whole idea of positive and negative. So most of the mass is with the positives, but you've got these tiny little negatives that are there as well. So here's the deal. It is the raisin bun model, sometimes referred to as the plum pudding model. You've got electrons, these tiny little negatives with super, 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 super 
small mass, but a fairly big charge embedded in a positive fluid. It's still a sphere of mass, so it's still a solid chunk of mass, but uh, we're now including those charges, which is pretty cool. So evenly distributed and uniform density is sort of what we're looking at for the charges and the mass there. Cool. This could explain cathode ray tubes, but does that mean that it's correct? Not so much, right? So the next person we want to talk about today is the Rutherford, or sorry, is Rutherford and the Rutherford scattering experiment. So Rutherford tested the idea that they were uniform density. So essentially what he did was he had something that would emit alpha particles, so a radioactive substance that emits alpha particles. He passes them through a slit so they're all lined up nicely and he blasted them at a very, very, very extremely thin, extremely thin gold plate and then figured out what happened to those after part those particles after. So on the detecting screen they'd show up, he would see where exactly they went. So just to tell you a little bit more about gold, this might be a little bit hard to read, but this is a full-size billboard. Like if a person was standing on this working on it, the person would probably look to be about that big. A full-size billboard that you see driving down the highway, and two ounces of gold could stretch out to the point where it could cover that entire billboard. Gold you can get very, 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 very thin. So a little bit better look at his apparatus what it would have looked like in real life. So here's what we've got here. So the prediction is, if we've got these alpha particles, if it's uniform density, one of two things should happen. It should smash into them and just stop entirely, right? Or if it's thin enough, it should just plow straight on through. That's not a very straight arrow, but plow straight on through. Here's the actual observation. Most of the alpha particles plowed straight on through with very, very, very little deflection. So less than 10 degrees. Very, very little. And when I say most, I mean like 99.99% of them pass straight through with little deflection. So that kind of fits Dalton's. It's the ones that didn't, or sorry, Thompson's model of the atom. It's the ones that didn't that couldn't be explained by Thompson's model of the atom. Why would they go at wonky, weird angles? Right, so that one in 10,000 that goes at a crazy angle. So Rutherford described this by saying that, well, maybe it's not what we see right here. Maybe it's not a completely 100% solid chunk of gold. Um, maybe it fits more into this sort of an idea, right? Where I've got most of the mass, and that's most of the positive mass, as well as neutrons that he, he came up with as well, the idea of neutrons. But uh, most of the mass is stuck in the center. There's a ton of empty space with just a little tiny electrons buzzing around the outside. So little tiny electrons buzzing around the outside. And this, honestly, this doesn't even do it justice with the side. I think I got a picture up here. Yeah, this is a little bit better. So if this stadium is the size of the entire atom and outside in the nosebleeds, way up here, way up here, that's where we have electrons, a tennis ball in the middle would be our nucleus, right? So most of the mass, and then everything else in between is just empty space empty space. That's a little bit more. Uh, Bill Nye also does one on this where you like, he puts up a little tennis ball and then he starts running and he runs something like 500 meters or it's American, so maybe 500 yards and then he gets to an electron and electrons like a little tiny dot that you can still barely even see. Like crazy how small that nucleus is compared to the size of the atom. So key is most of the atom is empty space. So let me just figure out, uh, I'll just draw it on here to be honest. The explanation for this one. So if you're blasting these alpha particles at this, most of them absolutely are just going to go through empty space, right? Because most of the atom is empty space. So most of them are going to go through with almost no deflection. It's only the ones that get close enough to that nucleus that are going to be deflected. And the closer they get, the more they get deflected. Right? And we can think about that in terms of uh, Coulomb's experiment, where we get Fe is equal to KQ1Q2 
over r squared, the bigger the deflection, the bigger the force is going to be needed, and the bigger the force, the smaller the radius, because Fe has an inverse relationship, or sorry, an inverse squared relationship with the radius. So it's only a couple of those that are going to get close enough to actually interfere and have a sizable electric force from that radius. The rest, just going to pass straight on through, not even notice that it's there. Cool, so that's our Rutherford model of the atom and, and why exactly we've got it. <laughs> so Rutherford's model, this is great. It explains all of the results of the scattering experiment. So what did the most of the alpha particles do? Pass straight on through the empty space, no problem. Uh, which observation surprised Rutherford? So that's the one in 10,000 that are getting deflected. How did he explain it? Well, they're repelled by the nucleus. So the very, very, very small nucleus, not many of them actually get that close to the nucleus, so not many of them are deflected. The closer they get, the more deflected they are. Perfect. And then this graph actually kind of shows the scattering angle versus uh, the scattered alpha particles, and lots of them, most of them, have zero deflection. Very, very few of them have uh, have large deflections. And notice this is an exponential scale that we've got over here as well. Cool. You know what the biggest problem with uh, with this model of the atom, the Rutherford model of the atom, is? He's got those electrons buzzing around the outside in somewhat circular motion. So they're buzzing around the outside. They're accelerating, in other words. And what did Maxwell say about accelerating charges? He said that accelerating charges create EMR. Starting to see a problem with this? First and foremost is all of our atoms that we see all around us blasting us with EMR constantly. Nope. Definitely not. The other issue with this is more of a law of conservation of energy thing. So if they're giving off energy in terms of uh, they're giving off energy in terms of EMR, they themselves should have less energy. So the electrons should have less energy. And what type of energy would that electron have? It would have kinetic energy, and it would slow down, and its radius would get smaller, and it would crash into its nucleus in a matter of, well, almost nanoseconds, right? So 10 to the negative 8 seconds. So all matter would pretty much instantly collapse in on itself, which is also something that we don't really see. I'm sitting on my chair and, you know, leaning on the table, and I am not falling through it. I am, you know, I don't see this table collapsing in, in front of me or anything. So it's, it's clearly not happening. So, we're going to get into models of the atom that, well, help with this and help with a couple other things. This is almost it for today's class. Here's a little tiny review quiz for you because I know there is no practice for this one whatsoever. So, maybe put this on pause, see if you can figure out the answers to these questions. Go ahead, put it on pause right now. Nice. So, first model of the atom. We should know uh, Dalton uh, slash, he had his billiard ball, so we know the scientist and the model. The next model of the atom was the Thompson, Thompson slash raisin bun. That's not how you spell raisin. That's a little better, I think. Who tested this model? Rutherford. Rutherford tested the model. Uh, what were the two major results? Most passed straight through. Most alpha particle passed straight through. The other result, the unexpected one, is a few alpha particles had, oops, had crazy Deflection. Deflection. There we go. So that led to our new model of the atom, the Rutherford or the planetary model of the atom. And key feature, I can't believe I don't have the key feature of this. I'm going to put it up here. 
empty space is one of the key features. So electrons buzzing around a very, very, very small nucleus. Uh, most of the mass is in the nucleus, and most of the atom is actually empty space. Um, the major weakness is EMR is not given off, which Maxwell would have predicted, right? EMR, holy moly, that says ERM, EMR, not given off. Cool. So, that should be a fairly easy one for you. There's no practice for this one. You just kind of got to know the ideas, and honestly, you probably won't be tested on them too much, but uh, it's good to have an understanding of the ideas. So, next couple lessons that we'll be looking at are getting into, again, the Bohr model and the Schrodinger model of the atom, but that's it for now. See you later, Physics 30s.